It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. Welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today. Oh, the big program, lots to get to, lots to talk about. Got an interesting uh, guest pitch recently. And look, I get guest pitches from all across the political spectrum, uh, right, left, center, crazy, uh, you name it, I get it. Uh, you've been doing this as long as I have. You, you tend to be on a lot of mailing lists. And people throwing their ideas out. Hey, we want to get our guests out to talk about our very important issues. And and, and I got one from the, I, 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 I was shocked by it. I was stopped in my tracks going, what? Uh, they have, have reached out to me? Do they not know? Uh, the Center for Union Facts sent me a guest pitch because evidently they're going to be uh, putting up some billboards around the RNC convention in Milwaukee uh, that I think they thought I would be interested in. And what they are, and, and maybe it's that they know that I have a problem with Sean O'Brien playing footsie uh, with Donald Trump. Maybe, maybe, maybe they knew that as a 35 year Teamster member, I had a, a little bit of a problem uh, with Teamster president, Sean O'Brien, you know, making the pilgrimage down to Magalago and then, you know, holding the press conference in our hall uh, and giving Trump the ability to uh, to do his little song and dance in front of thunder and lightning. Uh, maybe that was it. And then, well, there there have been some things along the way. But, you know, that happens. So when I saw this guest pitch, because uh, I, I got to assume that's what their thinking was. Uh, of this billboard that is a uh, picture of, of Sean O'Brien uh, with the, the line of, uh, you know, two-faced Teamsters, question mark, with the underline 99% of dues spent on political advocacy went to the left. For more information, go to unionfacts.com. And, and so I'm like, wait a second, how could a an organization that says that they're the facts, you know, the union facts, the place where I'm supposed to get truth and honesty from, how can that, how can it be that they've lied right to me in their billboard? 99% of dues dollars spent on political ad advocacy went to, went to the left 99%. Um, outside of that number, I don't know where they, what orifice they pulled it out of, but here's what I do know. Here is the fact. So maybe the Center for Union Facts needs some union facts. And they came to the right person. Here I am. You cannot spend dues dollars on political advocacy. You can't do it. Uh, the Teamsters has this, this fund. Uh, it's, a, it's the DRIVE Pact. It stands for Democrat, Republican, Independent Voter Education. It was started by Jimmy Hoffa back in the 60s. I've donated it a good portion of the 35 years uh, that I've been there. So when money is spent on politics, it's the donations that I make to DRIVE and that you know hundreds of thousands of other Teamster members make to this DRIVE fund. That That's what goes to political activities. No dues dollars. So right from the start, you've lost me by lying. You've lost me with misinformation. Now, I wanted to have them on because I said immediately, oh, yes, please. I would love to have you, Center for Union Facts, come sit down with me and explain to me this, this magical number and which orifice you doth pulled it out of. I also want to know who's paying for the signs, who's paying for the billboards, who pays your salary. Oh, we don't know. You're private. So we don't know the, the front group uh, funding that you're getting. We don't know if it's the, the, the beverage uh, folks or the, the NFIB or, or we have no idea. Or if it's billionaires just handing you cash. What I can tell you it's not are actual working people. So I was, I was surprised 
uh, that they would do this. And also, also very surprised that let's say it were true just hypothetically. And we know that it's not because one, it's impossible because it would be illegal to have any dues dollars going to it. And two, 99% is a, come on, <laughs> you should have just gone with a hundred. Um, why would they be against O'Brien going to the RNC? If that's true, that 99% number is true. Wouldn't this overture of going to speak to the, the faithful of the RNC be an opportunity for them to win some of those, those dollars? Wouldn't that make some sense? Uh, and the answer is no, because uh, for them, it's not that at all. Cause they understand what the game is. The game is red hat, blue hat. Um, and we're supposed to play that. But for them, it's all about the money. They know none of those people in the in the hall are going to buy whatever's being said. They they know what they know. They know why O'Brien's there. And understand, this kind of treatment is what you get when you sell out to these people. This is what they do. You know, the reality is Sean O'Brien is going to be their whipping boy. Uh, they are going to use him and and my Teamsters Union as their hood ornament uh, as they drive their anti-union policy truck right over the top of working people. And the reality is, is Sean O'Brien is going to be their dancing show pony, whether he wants to be or not. And they're going to ride him until the until election day. Because what they understand, what Trump understands, what the RNC gets by giving him this, this platform is his, a lot of his members vote for Republicans. This is making it okay. This is going, yeah, don't worry about your job. Don't worry about any of that stuff. It's okay. We're It's fine. Because here's the thing, regardless of what his message is, it's only going to normalize and make the anti-union party, the most anti-union party and president that we've ever known, um, seem normal. Like this is any other time. It's like any other election. So, you know, as I think of O'Brien going to the RNC and doing his song and dance, you know, I, I got to go, what's the message? What's he going to say? And, you know, immediately my mind went to, what do you say to your executioner? When you walk up to the gallows, what do you say to that person who pulls the, the hood off your head? Do you beg and plead? Uh, do you, do you surrender? Well, do you put up a fight? I'm waiting to see. Because here's the thing, does he believe, does President O'Brien believe that the GOP is just going to, well, they just don't understand. And, and he's going to say some words that will change their hearts. You know, I heard President O'Brien say uh, that Josh Hawley, who he gave drive money to, uh, didn't know what right to work laws were. I find that impossible to believe that a U.S. Senator doesn't know what a right, what the right to work laws are, especially in a state that's been fighting right to work for a very long time. And uh, my mind goes, you know, does president O'Brien think that his presence is going to change the, the proverbial Grinch's heart to magically support the expansion of, of rights for all working people. Yes. We now we have seen the errors in our way. And we now support collective bargaining because we understand that, you know, a strong workforce where, where workers share in the, in the prosperity of the company and have some job security, that's the way to build an economy. Do you think that's going to happen? Especially since I don't know if you've been paying attention to what our Supreme Court is doing. You know, the Republican installed Supreme Court hell bent on returning work in America to the good old days of the eighties and nineties and not the 1980s and nineties. We've talked about on this program, how they want to revive the Lochner era and make poverty wages and desperate work great again. Somehow is, is a speech that president O'Brien is going to give. Is that going to change any of that? Is that going to bring them to, to our side? Is that going to say, no, you've been, we've been wrong. Is he going to push back against privatization schemes of our commons? You know, like our public services, like our public schools. Will we hear anything about that? And will that change their hearts and minds? Will this olive branch bring them to our side or at least to the middle? Um, I, I, 
really? Is he going to question the people who brought us Janice? You know, I have a, a, a union friend who regaled me in long discussions about how hard life is in the public sector because of Janice telling me that he's never voting for that Joe Biden. Going to vote for the other guy. Is he going to question the end of the Chevron doctrine, which is certainly going to affect unions? Uh, it's going to affect uh, administrative agencies like OSHA. You know, you heard Jordan Barab on this program not too long ago talk about what the end of the Chevron doctrine is going to mean to, to safe working conditions, to health and safety on the job. It's certainly going to hurt the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board. You know, those people who, both groups, who are there to protect workers' rights and to protect their health and safety, you know, those folks. Or, I, I guess, maybe, maybe he's going to rub elbows with the people who want to dismantle the NLRB. You know, because Elon, over at Tesla, and or SpaceX, actually, is what it was, uh, and, and, and Bezos over at Amazon, which... I'm guessing he still wants to organize and Trader Joe's, which should be organized. Uh, they all want to do away with parts of the NLRB. Maybe he'll take a selfie with them like he did with Dana White, who broke a union campaign uh, years ago when the Teamsters and the culinary workers tried to organize the MMA fighters. Or is he going to talk about how the Supreme Court, uh, that decision in Glacier Northwest versus the Teamsters, uh, will subject unions to frivolous lawsuits and potentially costly rest restitution and fines. You can hear anything about that? Probably not. Because understand, he's going to be standing in front of a crowd of people who understand why he's there. He's to legitimize their existence to working people in this country. Understand, these are the people who hate workers, especially union workers. And look, in normal times, I could justify going and talking with, with Republicans and trying to find common ground. I've done it for years. These not normal times. Sorry, not going there. You can't normalize a Donald Trump. You can't normalize a party that wants to, that is running on a platform of firing all those federal workers and replacing them with good loyalists, making patronage great again. Sorry, I'm not buying. What we know is the GOP wants to destroy our America by repealing the 20th century and, and turning back the clock, not just on unions, but on all the progress that our grandparents and great grandparents fought for. Normalizing this party puts you on the wrong side of history. And I take no joy in this. Look, I, I love my Teamsters union. It's done great things for me and it does great things for working people. But this, another, another mistake. I support, I supported you, Sean O'Brien. I want you to do well. I want you to succeed. I want you to organize and fight for the best contracts possible. But this, this is a mistake. On this, you're on the wrong side of history. I want to hear your thoughts. Are there Teamsters out there who, who agree or disagree? I want to hear your thoughts. We, maybe we'll take a, a poll and find out. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, this Teamster thinks it's a mistake. Back after this. From the steel mills of Pennsylvania, to the auto factories of Michigan, to the modern makers room, manufacturing makes our nation great. I'm Scott Paul president of the Alliance for American Manufacturing. We bring business and labor together to advocate for policies that everyone can agree on. Together, we can strengthen manufacturing and create good paying American jobs. Help us keep it made in America. The old factory towns in America's heartland have been taking a beating. Thing is though, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Unions are making a comeback. More organizing in the last couple of years than in a long time. And the Biden administration being more supportive of unions than any president since FDR. 
We're finally turning things around after 40 years of screwing over working people. But will we keep moving in the right direction? That's our choice as Americans. So it's been an interesting couple of days uh, as it's sad to see that the Democratic Party is literally tearing itself apart over uh, the call for, for President Biden to step aside. And look, I understand. And we talked about this the other day. I understand if you're on the, uh, you know, Biden's got to stay no matter what. Uh, don't care. Don't care if he's in a coma. I'm voting for him. And understand, uh, in November, if he's on the ballot, he's the guy I'm voting for. I've said this from day one. Uh, I, I started in the position of going, hey, look, I think Joe Biden's going to do what's in the best interest of our country. I believe he's a good and decent, honest man. I'm, I believe he's thoughtful. And I think I think there's a moment where you just have to go, uh, can he do it or not? As I said yesterday on the program, we'll see. Uh, you know, Give him some time to get out there and, as I put it yesterday, uh, get his Irish up. We'll see. But I do find it interesting that the, the parts, parties are eating each other, especially uh, the folks who are saying that calling on him to resign is... Uh, I think what was it, bed wedding and 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 you know pa- pants wedding and um, you know a, a whole bunch of you know clutching at pearls. Wish I had pearls. I find it interesting that that's the that's the battle, instead of what we saw, and 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 look, you know, you well, you know, the attack on George Clooney, which I think is hysterical. Because Clooney's a guy who's been a lifelong Democrat. He's been he's been at all of the fundraisers. He's done all of the things that you could want from from one of the the stars in Hollywood. Uh, doesn't get involved in too much unless you ask him to. Uh, but he wrote an op ed over at the New York Times, and and it was pretty. It was it was it was exactly. I got to be honest. It was exactly what what I would what I would what I've said. Uh, I love Joe Biden. Uh, I loved him as a senator. Loved him as a vice president. As a president. Um, you know, he says, you know, he says, I consider him a friend and I believe in him, believe in his character, believe in his, in his morals. Uh, in the last four years, he's won many of the battles he faced, but the one battle he cannot win is the fight against time. None of us can. It's devastating to say it, but Joe Biden, but the Joe Biden I was with three weeks ago at the fundraiser was not the Joe effing big deal, uh, effing deal Biden. Uh, of 2010. He wasn't even the Joe Biden of 2020. He was the same man we all witnessed at the debate. Um, He said, look, you know, was he tired? Yes. A cold? Maybe. But our party leaders need to stop telling us that 51 51 million people didn't see what we just saw. We're also terrified by the prospect of a second Trump term that we've opted to ignore every warning sign. That is exactly what we've been saying here. And it's exactly what I believe that Joe will do what's in the best interest of the country. But for the party to eat itself, this could be a unifying moment. This could be a moment where, um, you know, if he does get out there and he does better, maybe it pulls the party together. He fights and he, he holds on. Maybe, but I'm looking at the polls. Initially, I said, well, there wasn't really any, any drop. Things are bad. And I don't like that because this guy has been the best president for working people in my lifetime. This guy has done virtually all of the things that I've been asking for, for almost two decades doing this show. So to be on the side of, uh, I think he needs to step down, uh, is a struggle for me. Uh, but again, I come back to, uh, on this side of the aisle, we do what's best for the country, not what's best for an individual. And look, everybody should be calling for Donald Trump to step aside, not because he's too old. He, he's getting up there. Uh, does a lot of, a lot of things that you go, um, huh? I think, I think John Stewart did a great, did a great bit on this. Uh, what did you just say? Does an awful lot of really bizarre stuff. 
not to mention 34 felonies, not to mention, you know, the grabber by the, you know, what, all, all the other stuff that we know about. Tons of allegations of, of immorality, impropriety, uh, someone who views the 10 commandments, I believe as a, as a checklist, there's someone who should be resigning. There's someone, there's someone to be quite honest, shouldn't even be in a, in a position to have to resign. And what does it say about us as voters? What does it say about us as a country that that person's even remotely palatable? What does it say about, well, the Republicans right now who talk about family values, who talk about uh, their religiosity, who talk about we're a Christian nation, who talk about family and you know, go down the list, personal responsibility and yeah small, less intrusive government while they're trying to weaponize government. What does it say about them that this is their nominee? You know, so when people reach out to me and go, well, why aren't you calling for, for, for him to step aside? Because it's an exercise in futility. Because the people that support him, support him for all the reasons that you think should disqualify him. So this race is about much more than just two old guys. This race is about the decency, the dignity, the hope for a future, the humanity in this country. Who are we? What are we telling the rest of the world when half of the country is saying that we're behind Donald Trump? Unapologetically. In fact, wearing it on our shirts and on our hats and flying flags in front of our homes with profanity and, and ignorance on display. What does that say? In a place where we've got real problems. You know, just, just the other day, I, I, I saw uh, House Speaker Mike Johnson. Uh, he spoke at the Hudson Institute. And he was talking about, again, the agenda, the stuff we're not talking about. While we're talking about, is Joe Biden too old? Uh, or we're talking about, yeah, you know, Donald Trump wears a diaper. You know, so he's literally dumping um, the important stuff. That, that doesn't seem to get us anywhere. Uh, but what he said at the Hudson Institute was something along the lines of, we're going to go and cut Social Security. We're going to go and cut those entitlement programs. We're going to go slash and burn that, that stuff so that we can increase the military budget. Now, understand, <laughs> uh, I think we spend more on military than like the top, I don't know, 20 countries combined. Uh, we account for you know, almost half of all military spending on this planet. We could literally end homelessness. We could end hunger. We could do all kinds of stuff. But we've chosen to spend it on the military. Now, am I anti-military? No. I'm in favor of having a big, muscular uh, military that you, you put over there behind glass when, when in case of emergency break here. I agree with Teddy Roosevelt, walk softly, carry a big stick. All in, I, I agree with that because I think there's a deterrent to it. But to say that we're going to slash granny's social security or more likely my social security and my generation and future generations opportunity to retire so that we can continue to feed this monster kind of a problem especially when you're talking about a time, and again, you can't make this stuff up, where you've got a Boeing CEO who's stepping aside, the company that went and agreed to a uh, to plead guilty, you know, as long as it's just fines, you know, we're not going to put the, the CEO in jail. Of course not. Uh, you know, to the tune of billions of dollars. So, um, you think about what happens to granny's uh, social security and, and, and grandpa's, you know, pension, you know, it used to be, you work 40 years, you got a gold watch and you got a defined benefit pension. I don't think they're giving out the gold watch. I don't even think you get a card anymore, but what do you do have is you got a Boeing CEO who ran, basically ran that country company 
right into the ground. Not to mention a couple planes that killed, what, 340 some odd people. He gets to walk away with a golden parachute of some, what, $45 million? And of course, going to be taxed at a lower rate thanks to Donald J. Trump. So for me, I look at this, this place that we're in and we're having, one, all of the wrong conversations. We're not talking about how we're going to make lives better and futures better for our children and our grandchildren and, and creating a, a, a better future uh, for, for humanity. No, we're not talking about that at all. We're talking about an old guy who sadly is diminishing and a guy who, who lies repeatedly and wears a diaper. When do we get to the stuff that makes lives better? And this is why, again, I think people are frustrated. They're angry because they don't see their government doing the work for them. We've been fed this red hat, blue hat stuff. We got to be in our teams and we got to fight each other and, and, and all of that. And it's, look, understand, it's the elites doing this. It's us. It's we, the working people. We're the ones who have to talk to each other in the workplace. We're the ones who have to talk to our, each other in the churches. We're the ones who have to talk to each other in our social in our social interactions. And then find a way to find that common ground that we agree on. Because, you know, I go back to this and, and I, I still believe it. That we agree on more than we disagree on. You know, sometimes we're fed these, these crises. You know, someone's going to the wrong bathroom. Someone's marrying someone else. And then that's what we're fixed on. We're fed a constant diet of it. The outrage machine of our mainstream corporate controlled right wing media is amazingly powerful because they know what divides, what angers. That's what sells. That's what gets your juices flowing. Not talking about, hey, you know, um, the job I do now for a living. Um, you know, you go back to the 80s when I started. Had it just kept up with inflation, the wages I was making back then, I'd be making about, about $15 to $18 an hour more. Where's that money? Where did it go? And that's just not me. That's across the entire workforce. So you wonder why you're struggling to put food on the table? It's because your wages haven't kept up. If you're wondering why you, you're struggling to keep to pay the rent and keep clothes on the kids' backs and do all that, it's because your wages have not kept up. And why? Well, we've got a Republican Party hell-bent on destroying workers' rights and a Democratic Party that, to be fair, was not always the greatest ally. Until Joe Biden. And I stand by Joe. I know he'll do the right thing, but more importantly, I stand by the people that he put it in with him. I stand by this Democratic Party now. I want to hear your thoughts? Email me, Rick at the Rick Smith Show.com. Quick break, right back. I've been driving buses for five years and. My day-to-day -day routine is I wake up a little earlier than most people. I get on a bus, I go out, I pick up some students and make sure they get to school nice and safe. Here in Fairbanks, Alaska, that can be a challenge because of the winter weather and the icy roads. But I love the job. So the Teamsters are great. They provide us a lot of protections. They've always taken care of their people, made sure that our jobs were secure. We didn't have to worry about whether or not we'd have a job from day to day. Uh, and that's amazing because before we'd be working four, six, eight hours a day and only earning minimum wage was real difficult to make a living. And then the Teamsters pushed a lot. So we make something we can live off of and not have to have a second job. What absolutely gives me peace of mind. The, the union membership allows me to focus on this job without having to worry about whether or not my family is going to be taken care of. I'm Andrew Case and I'm proud to be Teamsters Local 959. So on Wednesday, uh, the House of Representatives actually passed something. <laughs> the Safeguard American Voter Eligibility Act, or the SAFE Act. Their SAVE Act. SAVE. I don't know what they're saving, uh, but it passed by a vote of 221 
to 198. You've got uh, 216 Republicans, five Democrats uh, who voted for it. Uh, Henry Kular, the guy from Texas, uh, Don Davis from North Carolina, Jared Golden from Maine, Maine, Vincent Gonzalez Jr. from Texas, uh, Maria Glusenkamp Perez from Washington. Uh, what's interesting about this is the Brennan Center actually did some research on this back in 2017. And what they found out of like 20, I think like 24 million votes that they examined, uh, there were 30 that were suspected of being non-citizens voting. None none proved, but 30 that they, they suspected could have been. So you're looking at like a 0.0001. Uh, is this worth Congress's time? And is it, isn't it already illegal? And here to share some thoughts on this, the guy who actually helped write uh, the Help America Vote Act that already made this illegal, our good friend, former Ohio congressman and political analyst, Bob Nay. Bob, thanks for taking time for us. Thanks, Rick. I was going to give you a, you, you blew the punchline. I was going to give you a trivia test and, and show how schooled you are on all this, okay? Hit me. Well, the trivia test was what two members, uh, actually quite good looking intelligent members in 2002 <laughs> passed the felony attestation act one's democrat he's still there one's republican uh who does radio things so obviously it would be uh uh steady hoyer and 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 well you yes yeah steady hoyer and i uh we co we, uh, we authored the help america vote act ted kennedy and, and mitch mcconnell can you imagine that combination today something like it in the senate and that was a different world. And, and it, it was a complicated election bill. Jimmy Carter called it, next to civil rights, one of the greatest um, rights bills and movements because he and Gerald Ford, Carter and Ford, put together the Ford Commission with Baker that we took the information off of it. I mean, it was just a perfect way to do it. Now, one of the things that we agreed on was there would be a felony attestation. So Everybody in the country, this is a mandate, everybody in the country, when you sign this form, you are automatically attesting, it's an attestation that you are a citizen of the United States. So Democrat and Republican board members who say, wait a minute, I think that person is clearly not a citizen, have a legal way to pursue it, whether it's you know 30 people, one person, Ohio, I don't know if they had one or something, but it's already there. So today uh, is a, what, what do I want to call it? A uh, look what we did. Time. Um, yeah, it's reaffirming Steny and I. How about that? They should call it the reaffirmation vote for the Help America Vote Act. No, but, you know, as I look at this, you know, you go, well, you, you have to get a government ID. Uh, you have to have a, you know, a, a passport, a military ID. And, you know, I thought, you know, I seem to remember there were people, especially on the Republican side, who were opposed to national ID cards or, or any of that kind of centralized databasing. But, you know, the thing that is, if this were to pass, and I don't think it's got a chance of actually becoming a law because it's already illegal. But what I would find really interesting is when that 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 red hat guy shows up and, and they go, well, we need your passport or we need your birth certificate and they can't find it. Well, we 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 left uh, the. IDs up to the states, Steny and I did. Now, what we did, uh, we mandated certain things, provisional voting so that people aren't turned away from the polls. You know, you're not told, no, you don't live here. You, you've got to go away, whether it's because of your sex or your race or your political affiliation. And we mandated the attestation. Some of it, though, we mandated the last four of your social security or some form of proof, like a bank statement or something showing your address. But we left it loose for the states, you know, on the ID end of it. This would federalize, you know, IDs. Uh, so that was something way back when that we all agreed we weren't going to do, you know. And I don't think much of the attitude has changed. I don't think you'll, you'll get a federalized, quote, ID system uh, out there. But again, there is an attestation. And the point yeah. is, Everybody has to sign, and if you're illegal, then you'll you'll pursue it. Now, let me give you the other scenario on this, Rick. Too, I'm a board of elections person. Somebody, you know, produces an ID, and oh, okay, they're a citizen. 
Well, you know, they could have manipulated something. Uh, they could add false papers. So it still is going to boil down to people, you know, thinking there's a reason that this person in particular may not be a citizen. It can be checked out and they have signed an attestation. So I don't see where the, the ID thing is going to do anything for the system whatsoever, except complicate it. Oh, yeah, but it makes people feel better. Uh, and here's the thing, this whole thing defies logic. If you are here in an undocumented status, if you are here illegally, um, I, I doubt you're going to show up to a government facility and, and give them your name and address. Mm -hmm. uh, it just it just it defies logic to me. Well, in, and, and in general, they they don't. And there have been some that have. But again, it's so small of an amount of people because you're right. In general, people don't say. I think I'll go risk everything to, you know, to, to go vote. Uh, and then there's some people that had a green card, thought they could vote. I mean, there's some of that, too, that's out there. See, in my experience of, from the people that I've talked to, the vast majority of, of this stuff that happens is, is people error. Uh, oh, I, I thought I was able to. I got this green card. I'm in the process of getting my citizenship. I'm, you know, all of this stuff. That, that okay, we fixed that. But, you know, this just seems like a um, a solution and in, in, in looking for a problem. Well, it's, it's, you know, it's sexy and spicy type of vote. When, Is it? When, well, for people, oh, sure, oh, sure. People are going to be home. I'm stopping the illegals who are going to take over the United States uh, tomorrow morning. Now, I when this it. all came up, Steady and I had the same opinion. I can remember the quote. Call me old fashioned, but I think you ought to be a citizen of the United States to vote. That was our question. I agree. And yeah, so I mean, I'm I'm all for citizens only voting. And so we made the attestation. End of the story. If somebody believes that somebody is not legal, you've got a means today to do it. You've had it since 2002. Yeah, this is the this is the press release vote where because think about it. Who's going to come back right, right now? And the media won't dig into it. Back in locals. Who's going to come back and say, look what you did. You're just doing this for show. Yeah, they're not going to do it. So this will be a newsletter or a, you know. Campaign press, literature. Press release, right. Yes, campaign That's literature. That's all it is. Let's move along. I have, I'm have. i not sure if you saw this or not, uh, but the, some senators have reached out to Merrick Garland uh, over the our attorney general, and they have sent him a, uh, a letter saying, hey, I th we think you should look at that Clarence Thomas guy. Uh, maybe uh, appoint a, a special counsel to, to probe all of the trips that, uh, that 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 Thomas has taken. And in fact, you know, in one in on one of the pages, page fourteen, actually, uh, they point out that uh, you know, Thomas may have taken a trip to Russia, a, a yacht trip, and a private helicopter flight to to Putin's palace. What is our Supreme Court justice doing in Putin's palace? Well, I mean. I, if he if he did that, he shouldn't have been there. But on top of it, all the other trips, the, you know, the money. And look, uh, I took a trip. I filed that trip. Wasn't the right amount of money, but I filed it. And I was born in Weeming, West Virginia. Lived temporarily in Morgantown Federal Corrections in West Virginia. I'm not going to be buried in West Virginia. Uh, so, you know, I, I paid the, the penalty of the improper filing on the trip. And I'm looking at the Supreme Court. I'm thinking, why are they different than any of us uh, that are in Congress, were in Congress, or anybody else about filings? Why should the Supreme Court be different? Just because they're the highest court in the land, why should they get a free ride? You know, Roberts didn't do anything about it. He looked into it. Uh, it, it just shouldn't happen. So I think it's very interesting for them to put the pressure, you know, towards uh the attorney general to say what he thinks, what should it be looked at? I mean, otherwise Supreme court just does not have to follow any ethical yeah. guideline. Now I'm also sure you saw that uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, introduced articles of, of impeachment against yeah. Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito uh, yeah. because they failed to recuse themselves uh, in, in cases that, well, you know, you know they've, they've got friends in those areas. Yeah. Well, if I was uh, AOC's head staffer, I'd have said, hey, Thomas, yeah, leave Alito out of it because, yeah, the flag and his wife and blah, blah. I think Thomas is so 
full of ethical holes and it, it's such an issue. Everything I've read, and I don't know anything about the Russia thing, but even prior to this, anything I've read takes your breath away. So uh, I think focusing just on Thomas would have been better, but it's okay. You know, she's fouled on both. That again brings attention to. Yeah, I mean, wined and dined, flown all over the world, yachted across the world. I uh, had, you know, a kid of, uh, you know, I guess a grandnephew or something uh, put through school. Yeah, uh, bought the parents' house and turned it into yes, a into a museum. Happened. With, I need better friends. <laughs> yeah, I went on a golf trip. <laughs> I need better friends. Uh, let's move along. Uh, evidently, President Biden has sent a letter to Congress telling him he ain't going nowhere. Well, yes, I mean things are beginning to come apart at the seams. I think it's up to ten House members, one senator. And of course, George Clooney, which gets a lot of publicity. I thought the Biden campaign answer was horrible on uh, Clooney, basically alluding that the president has more stamina than than George Clooney because Clooney left early and the president stayed three hours. You know, president had a very adamant letter. I'm here. This is why I'm here. Now, some of the campaign's statements, too, are starting to become troubling because as they answered, these are Democrat elitists that want the president to leave. Yeah. One better you're be very, very careful about that. You know, oh, you're dividing the party. Yeah, very careful about that. I know Trump talks about elitists if anybody's against him, but this is a different ball game because <clears throat> everything's focused right now on the president. I will tell you this: whatever they're going to do, they need to do it. I mean, now by the time you know, your show ends, they need to, they need to wrap this up. When I say they, president powers to be the democratic party on two aspects by Sunday night, you know, the president is staying or he isn't. Now I know the president says I'm staying. He wrote the letter, but that's because <clears throat> the president has to be debating it now, but he can't come out and show any sign of weakness because then the media goes nuts. If he would say, for example, I'm staying, but I'm going to talk to Jill Biden tonight and my family about it. Boom. The media is crazy. So, but if the president, and again, I'm serious this weekend, they, they can't be, be waiting another, you know, 10 days. If the president is staying, he's staying and you circle the wagons and you, and you go for it. If the president is leaving, though, if there's not a an, an agreed to exit strategy, you can't be having a couple of the senators say, well, let's pick a new person this way. Somebody else says, well, let's have a mini convention. I saw where they said Oprah Winfrey and some other people ought to have a series of, of candidates debate in front of them. I mean, they if one thing's for sure, if the president leaves, this needs to be absolutely lockstep. Here's our candidates. We go for it. We're going to go into the convention. No, I, uh, I think if, if the president is going to step aside, it's got to be this weekend sure. uh, before the RNC convention, because it will, that news will, will completely yes. suck the air out of, sure. out of the RNC's uh, little song and dance. Uh, and, and, you know, I had a guest this week say, look, you know, if he were to, you know, step down entirely, uh, hand the presidency off to to Kamala, uh, so that people get used to having her as president. She runs as an incumbent. You know that may be a way to go as well. I, I know some people are are pushing that. I don't think that's going to happen, but I do think that before the convention, the uh, an announcement has to be made. You know, if that did happen, <clears throat> because you know Kamala Harris can be debatable in the polls, but if that did happen, and he actually handed the presidency to her. That's an entirely different press ball game, entirely from there till the end of the election. That would be uh, quite incredible. Now he gets to be uh, Uncle Joe. He gets to say, "Look, I did. I did what I came to do. I saved democracy. I passed all this great stuff. This is my legacy." And they could run on that, going, "Look, he can go around doing rallies and all kinds of stuff, and 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 then." Pass that torch. I was always going to be the conduit to the future. There's so many great, sure. great ways to pass this along that would give him historically, I think would be an incredible legacy. 
but um, I don't. I still. I'm not sure that's going to happen. Yes, and it would also make him a hero within the Democratic Party because, as he says, he wants to save democracy. Well, if he believes in his heart of heart that Donald Trump is is going to destroy the democracy of the country, if he believes that, then you're right. He could spin that so many true ways of saying, "Look, I don't like this." I think I could have done okay, but I understand where this is headed, and I'm, you know, I'm going to hand it off. But within the Democratic Party, he would be a hero because if he stays and everything goes in a really bad direction, House, Senate, etc., then he's going to go down as the guy that you know took the party down in a in a tsunami. Uh, so no, yes. he was the guy who transitioned us into fascism. Yeah. That will be the legacy. So yes, you're right. There are a thousand ways to spin it. And you know the other thing that could be done? Look, I'm thinking, you're, you're a political guy. I am. You know, the exit, uh, have some accolades to him, uh, you know, some, some events. There could be a lot done with it. There could be an awful lot done with it. And, right. and it would be a lot of positive press. And, and you could, going into the, into, the, into the campaign, actually steal a couple of news cycles, which Democrats don't do well. Right. Uh, but you know, we'll see again. We'll see. But, you know, you the fact that that we're concerned about saving democracy. And I I I know, you know, about Project 2025. We've been talking about it on this show for a, just about a year now, uh, because right when it came out, we jumped all over it. Nobody seemed to think it was important. Now it's all the rage. Right. Because, uh, uh oh, maybe we shouldn't put the president in charge of of the FBI or the Justice Department. You know, maybe maybe that's a bad idea. But, you know, Donald Trump came out and he, he completely distanced himself from it. Why do you think he did that? Well, you know, you talked about 2025. I, another station I do, somebody called in about it and that's how they talked about it. But, yeah, you, you know, you were ahead of the curve and people talked about it a little bit and, and it got buried. But 1972, the Heritage Foundation came into being. Ronald Reagan became the president and Heritage, you know, excelled. And of course, Heritage Foundation, this think tank, is about developing 2025 because it's an integral part of 2025. 2025 not only goes into completely redoing civil service to declassify jobs and basically make them all presidential appointments, which you know, I'd love to see the court actions on that one with civil service, but on top of it, it has language in there for Christian nationalism you know, to mandate basically uh, a, quote, Christian country, which, of course, there's this little thing in the Constitution called separation of church and state, separation of powers and church and state. But a beginning, you know, first of all, ideas were signed off and fed through the conservatives and the Trump campaign. Once I think Trump's top campaign people realized that what do you want to have any controversy like this for as it erupts, especially after January the 6th, especially after all the losses with the election fraud, Giuliani, et cetera, and, and especially uh, after the White House making the mantra about democracy and authoritarian government, the last thing you want is to have been part of a document that has, you know, the ability to basically hire and fire everybody at the whim of a president only in the entire federal system and to deem this will be a Christian nationalist run country. So yes, uh, I think Trump even said he, he never saw it or something. Oh, I, I find that to be BS. Uh, I think, you know, as I, I think I've read this somewhere before uh, that the whole reason he's, he, he came out against it is the perception that he's not in charge that he would have to share power or something. And, and I, it makes, it makes almost no sense because it gives him absolute control right. to hire and fire. It weaponizes government in ways that even Jim Jordan couldn't fathom. Yeah. And I think his campaign is at this point is like, look what's going on with the Republican platform. Yeah. Look, look at that. You know, they're, they're now diluting quote the abortion issue in some people's eyes. You know, I don't think so, but in some people's eyes, they are. So it's very interesting. They're trying to, for the first time in the last couple of years, calm things down a little bit to take the you know controversial side of this or that out. 
I won't stop lulling people to sleep. You know, false sense of security before they they give them the good jab. I hear you. I hear you, uh, Bob. As always, great stuff. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Our good friend Bob Nay. Want to hear your thoughts? Email me Rick at the RickSmithShow dot com. Quick break. Right back to wrap things up. Stick around. Q cells has been like the first around here that focuses on clean energy for millennials. Not a lot of us want to be jumping around job to job trying to figure out what we want to do. But in clean energy, we see a sense of job security and longevity, something that we're going to be able to do for a long time. It's important for Congress to invest in clean energy infrastructure because it sends a positive message to smaller communities like Dalton. It'll provide jobs for those that are struggling to meet their financial needs. Welcome back to The Rick Smith Show. Check out our website, therigsmithshow.com. So I saw this thing over on the, the Twitters. Uh, evidently, Twitter is, or X, or you know, uh, Elon Musk's little toy. Uh, evidently, they're, they're testing a dislike button. And, and I'm not quite sure what, you know, with all of the, the, the things behind it. I got to assume that the more people who dislike it, the further down it goes and the fewer people who see it. Now, the weird thing is, is the algorithm is so boogered up that most times, unless you pay Elon Musk, unless you pay for the blue check, um, they they throttle what people see of yours anyway. Uh, but the dislike button could probably just completely silence people entirely, which might be a reason to follow Elon Musk. Uh, because it seems like he's, He's turned, uh, it's right-wing propaganda all the time. Uh, and let's finish up on some interesting news. Uh, as you know, the Biden folks are, are pitching the idea of, of taking on junk fees, you know, going after the, how much they, they screw you over on ticket prices, how banks, if you happen to, to be a penny short in your account, uh, give you a good jab of an overdraft fee, sometimes you know, like 30, 35 bucks. Uh, and, and it's it's one of those things where they're charging you more of what they know you don't have. Uh, but according to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's proposed new rule, they would be capping that overdraft fee at just eight bucks because that's what they're saying it costs because uh, they get their money anyway. It's just this incentive, this this extra thing to, that they tack on to fatten their bottom line. And you go, well, if it only costs eight bucks, why do they charge 30? Where's that other 22 24, 26, where's that other money go? Well, I think we know where it goes. <laughs> it goes into their pockets. It's how they, well, it, it's it's how they, they give themselves lavish salaries and, and all of that. And what I found interesting is uh, the Wall Street Journal did a bit with uh, this Mariana Lake. She's the head of Chase's, um, you know, she's the head of their, their marketing department, I believe. Uh, of, of their Chase Bank. And she said, um, they're going to have to get it from other people. They're not losing their profit. And look, as I was searching the inner tubes for what do Americans spend every year on overdraft fees, I found numbers ranging from about $8 billion up to $17 billion a year. Pure profit for the big banks. Now me, I go to a credit union. And they don't charge you that that high fee. In fact, they generally give you, you know, a little bit of forgiveness, or they, you know, they'll pay it and then say, hey, you know, chuck it in here. A much different experience, or you know, they just take it from your savings account if you have one. Um, there's a lot of ways to ensure that you don't get. Uh, now I know what people say. Well, if you if you don't have the money, you shouldn't overdraft. Sometimes people make mistakes. Some people there are errors in math. Sometimes sometimes a, a direct uh, withdrawal comes out you weren't expecting. There are times when this stuff happens, and it seems to happen a lot to people who don't have money. You know, poor and working class people who are living paycheck to paycheck. So every couple of weeks, if something happens and you get dinged with a non-sufficient fund bill, it's going to cost you 34, 35. I think I, I think I saw one that was a, a, almost 50, someone was saying. Uh, it's It's a lot. And by taking this on, uh, I think the Biden folks have shown a little bit of, hey, you know, we we, we kind of care about you working folks. 
Uh, we want to make the playing field a little bit more level. And it's something I think is kind of important. It's just another one of those little things. Now, look, there's a lot of big things we should be doing without question. But it's one of those little things that makes you go, yeah, this is, this is why we should be um, voting for people who care about working folks. Just my thought. Want to hear yours? Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Something on your mind, something I said made you think, made you angry. I want to hear about it. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Miss any portion of the program? Grab the podcast. Also, check out freespeech.org for our videos. Uh, as always, thanks so much for being here. We'll see you back here next time. You've been listening to The Rick Smith Show. Email Rick Rick at rick at thericksmithshow.com. Until next time, this has been The Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk.